Dr. Abe Wondersman is a professor of psychology at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. He conducts research and program evaluation on citizen participation and community organizations and coalitions and on interagency collaboration. Examples of what we think of as troubled waters. Troubled waters are that if we take this, if we don't take this evidence and apply it with quality, we're not going to get the outcome. So the evidence might be there, but how do we apply it with quality so that we get the outcomes? I want to give you two quick examples of this troubled waters. It's a very interesting study done not too long ago, looking at crime prevention programs and substance abuse prevention programs in schools. And they looked at over 2,500 school districts and 5,800 schools. 
and they found that there was lots of prevention programs going on, but only 7.8%, only 8% of those programs were evidence-based. So 92% were not evidence-based. And of those 8%, only 44% were done with fidelity, which leaves you with about 3.5 evidence-based programs being used uh, in out of all those programs that, that exist. Yes. Now, this isn't just prevention programs. I won't go into this in detail, but it also illustrates the gap between science and practice, which is with electronic medical records. The federal agency, federal government is subsidizing with good intent the interest in electronic medical records <coughs> will lead to better practice and eventually reduce costs. And there was a study that showed that when you had hospitals like Harvard and elsewhere, and there was a study that showed that when you had hospitals like Harvard and elsewhere involved in the research study, it actually led to uh, less redundant testing and saved money. But there was a follow-up study that looking at what happened when it went to doctor's offices. And doctor's offices with electronic medical records actually made more tests, and it was more expensive. And they were trying to figure out what that gap was, and part of it was the quality of the programs, the computer. And they were trying to figure out what that gap was, and part of it was the quality of the programs, the computerized programs, whether or not the doctor's offices really knew how to use it well. So the gap between science and practice is not just prevention, it's really quite pervasive. Um, so what we need to do is we need to bridge research and practice. So the challenge is what, what do we do here? So this is the model that Sally talked about, how we generally go from research to practice. I love this model, but I believe that it's necessary but not sufficient to bridge the gap between science and practice. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a gap. And so where you see that question mark is, there's lots of evidence-based programs, but the top box, widespread use, that's not happening. So how do we deal with that question mark? So among, so among the things Sally mentioned is, um, we have evidence-based programs. I know it's hard for you to see. There are copies, also hard to see. Uh, available. I think we'll have these slides available on the website, or if you, you know, I can also email them to you. I'm happy to do that. But what this, but what this says is a version of what Sally was talking about. If you are a community, if you are a school, if you are a community-based organization, how do you figure out what to do? Sally described the first step of needs and resources. Then, given your needs and resources, what are your goals? That's number two. And once you know your goals, then you figure out what you're going to do. And that includes looking at evidence-based practices, which is number three. But those evidence-based practices need to fit your situation or context. So I work in teen pregnancy prevention. There are 31 evidence-based programs. If you are a boys and girls club or some other organization wanting to do teen pregnancy prevention, how do you decide which of the 31 to use? So you need to know about fit, which of those programs will fit with the values of, of the kids you're working with, with your organization. That's number four, and you also need to have the capacity to do that program. That program may have been created with millions of dollars of research and carefully trained graduate students, and now we're asking the Boys and Girls Club in Atlanta to do the same exact thing with Fidelity. There can be a gap there. Number six is the plan, who's going to do what, when, where, and how. Number seven is the implementation. You may have a great plan on paper. To what extent was it implemented with quality? Number eight, you did all that work. Did you get the outcomes? Number nine is continuous quality improvement. We need to have, I think, a culture of learning that we may not get it right the first time, but we're not going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. We're going to try to figure out how to do it better over time. And the last is sustainability. So we next we put this into place in something called getting to outcomes. And it basically uses the 10 steps that I just talked about. And it's colorful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really and it's frozen. And we call this the artist palette because it's the <coughs> same things I just talked about. What we care about is results. We think evidence-based practices are important but they're only one of the many things needed for a community-based organization or a school or any entity to act. All right, well, there's another slide. Let's leave this up there. 
that has the same idea about accountability. And accountability, particularly when I'm in Washington, sounds like a scary, scary word. <coughs> accountable. And I think of Secretary Sebelius talking about accountability. Accountability doesn't only have to mean blame and looking for what went wrong. If we do these things proactively, we have a better chance of reaching the results and using the time, energy, and money in a quality way. What we've done with, with the getting to outcomes is each of those 10 steps are phrased in an accountability question. And if you answer that question with quality, you have a pathway of how to be accountable and reach results. How do we get this stuff out there? So one of the things I've been doing with uh, colleagues at the CDC and elsewhere is developing something called the Interactive Systems Framework for Dissemination and Implementation. You got the stuff there, how do you disseminate it effectively, and then once it's disseminated, how do all these community organizations, schools, etc., actually implement it with quality? So this is the Interactive Systems Framework for Dissemination and Implementation. It's a little um, the top box is called the delivery system. These are the community organizations, the schools, etc., who are the ones who are going to have to do something about the situation where there are needs and resources. And Sally did a great job of talking about needs and resources. Um, what do they do? So if they're interested in bullying or if they're interested in childhood obesity, what do they do? Where do they go? How do they get that information? And so at the bottom, there's something called synthesis and translation. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of articles on childhood obesity. And there are at least hundreds of articles on bullying. Uh, no school superintendent or principal is going to read all those articles. What they need is a synthesis of the literature and a synthesis that's understandable. We call that translation. And Sally's going to be talking about that in the next presentation. So how does the information, even if it's synthesized and translated, actually get to that school district so that they can use it? The middle box is called the support system. And this is in the form often of training and technical assistance. Um, so the bottom box, Sally's going to talk about that synthesis and translation next. Talk about the bridge between the bottom box and the top box via the middle box, the support system, let's say a training and TA system. And this is what that looks like, okay? Again, this may be hard to see. It's a logic model about how training in TA centers, training and technical assistance centers, can work with community-based organizations, schools, et cetera, in a evidence-based way. So if we think it's important to be evidence, so if we think it's important to be evidence-based about our programs, we're also proposing that it's important to be evidence-based about how we support communities in actually doing the work they do. And that's what this logic model is about. The left is we want to, and that's what this logic model is about. The left is we want to achieve a certain desired outcome, which might be to do an evidence-based program with quality. We know that we're dealing with different levels of organizations. Some organizations are used to doing evidence-based work. Others are brand new. Some individuals have never heard of prevention and now they're asked to do it. How do you work with those different levels of capacity? And so we have four key components. One is tools. The next is training, because people can rarely pick up a big manual and know what to do with it all by itself, so there are trainings. The literature is very clear that training by itself is not sufficient. And so technical assistance and coaching that individualizes that information has come into play. And we're finding that often that's not good enough because people pick up from coaching what they want to do and what they're not comfortable with they don't do. And that can often undermine the quality of the intervention. So we've added quality assurance and quality improvement. That's a snapshot of some of the that's a snapshot of some of the ways of trying to bridge research and practice. So here, here are the takeaways. I've gone through things really quickly. The things that I want you to remember are the interactive systems framework with all those boxes. Those are a partnership between funders, researchers, and practitioners, and consumers figuring out how to work together in order to get outcomes. 
Um, I talked about the importance of accountability and illustrated that with getting to outcomes. And I talked about how important it is that if we want those evidence-based things to actually work in our communities, we need to really figure out how to support them better in evidence-based ways. And then last but not least, the investing in what works is developing policy briefs for federal else on how to take this kind of work to what's called going to scale, making it widespread.